questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice? And we give the call to the honourable member for Hume. My question is to the Treasurer. The latest economic data confirms that Australia is in an entrenched GDP per capita recession with five consecutive quarters of negative growth. This is the slowest GDP growth since 1991 outside the pandemic. At the same time, living standards have collapsed by 7.8 per cent under Labor. Our inflation remains amongst the highest and most persistent in the developed world. Why are Australians paying the price for this government's incompetence and mismanagement? Yeah. The call to the Treasurer. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I welcome the opportunity from the Shadow Treasurer to talk about today's national accounts. Because what today's national accounts show now, beyond any doubt, is that the economic strategy in the budget was exactly right for the combination of challenges that we confront together. And if we had taken the advice of those opposite, talking about $315 billion and too much spending and all the rest of the rubbish that they peddled, that would have been diabolical for an economy which was already weak and for people who were already under pressure, Mr Speaker. Now, when it comes to the per capita measures that the opposition member refers to, uh, it is not unprecedented for the economy to go backwards in per capita terms. We know that because it happened on their watch as well. It happened on their watch as well. And it's not uncommon around the world, Mr Speaker, to see that measure go backwards. Order. We've seen that Members in a number of left. countries over the last uh, couple of years. And so if he wants to ask about living standards, Mr Speaker, he should recognise that when we came to office, real wages, for example, were falling 3.4 per cent, and now real wages are growing again because of the efforts of this government to give people the kind of Order. cost of living relief and growing wages that they Please. need and deserve Leader when the economy the is soft and when people are under pressure. Now, Mr Speaker, you get a lot of free advice when you're putting budgets together. Some of it turns out to be right. Some of it turns out to be wrong. Almost everything that those opposite have said about the economy and the budget has turned out to be wrong, and that shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us, Mr Speaker, because they are the same characters that left behind massive deficits, a huge amount of debt, inflation almost double what it is now, real wages falling, real spending growth higher than it is now, and that's why, Mr Speaker, nobody takes the shadow treasurer especially seriously, and if he wants to ask lots Order. of questions about the national accounts and the budget, I'd say that would be a very good thing. Well, I call the member for I'm just going to acknowledge the Prime Minister with, for our guests. Thank, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. I want to acknowledge and warmly welcome His Excellency the President of Nauru and his delegation into our chamber today. It is an honour to have you, uh, President Adiyang. And I look forward to our discussion this afternoon about how we can further enhance the relationship between Australia and Nauru. We do have a special bond and an enduring partnership. And this afternoon we'll have discussions about how we can work together uh, to further our mutual prosperity and work together as well as uh, members in the Pacific Island Forum as well, building that cooperation amongst members of the Pacific family. Indulgence, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I join uh, with the Prime Minister in extending a very warm welcome to our dear friend uh, David Adiang. Adiang uh, President, uh, welcome. I first met David uh, about 20 years ago. He's aged much better than I have, uh, I might say. But, Mr President, uh, to you and to the people of Nauru, you are great friends, dear friends of Australia. We have worked together on many issues over a long period of time. And at this point in history, our two countries need to be as close together as we've ever been. And I know under your leadership we'll be able to facilitate that outcome. I also know that uh, you're an AFL supporter, but I hope tonight you'll be able to extend good support to the Maroons yeah. in the state of origin. Welcome, most welcome, and uh, thank you very much for your friendship. And Your Excellency, on behalf of the House, and also to the Honourable Jesse Jeremiah MP and to Your Excellency Mrs Camilla Solomon, the High Commissioner of the Republic of Nauru, a warm welcome on behalf of all members of parliament. I give a call to the Honourable Member for Reid. My question is to the Treasurer. What do today's national accounts tell us about the economy and the Albanese Labor government's approach in the budget? 
What are the alternatives? The call to the Treasurer. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I acknowledge and thank the member for Reid for her work to ensure that everyone, every taxpayer in her electorate gets a tax cut on the 1st of July and every household gets energy bill relief as well, Mr Speaker. Today's national accounts did confirm that growth in our economy was flat in the first three months of the year. Uh, it barely grew in the March quarter, just 0.1 per cent and 1.1 per cent through the year, but any growth in these circumstances is welcome. Uh, over the past year, around three quarters of OECD economies have recorded oh, wow a negative quarter, but Australia hasn't. Uh, the numbers came in broadly as the market expected, perhaps a little bit weaker. Uh, certainly we were expecting very soft conditions at the start of the year, and that's what we see in these numbers. Now, as I said before, Mr Speaker, there's lots of commentary about the budget settings. Some of it's objective, some of it's partisan, some of it's right, and some of it is now clearly and embarrassingly wrong. Today's numbers make it really clear that to slash and burn as those opposite and others called for would have been diabolical in these circumstances. These national accounts Order. show that we got the budget settings right. They justify our approach to fighting inflation and repairing the budget without smashing the economy when growth was already soft and the people were already under pressure. They completely vindicate our strategy to repair the budget and to provide cost of living health at Order. the same time. The RBA governor made it clear today that our two surpluses are already helping in the fight against inflation. And at the same time, we're supporting people with tax cuts and energy bill rebates and cheaper medicine and help with rent and student debt as well, Mr Speaker. And the consumption numbers back in this approach. Household consumption was soft, growing by 0.4 per cent in the quarter and below its decade average for five quarters now. There was a big focus on essential spending in household, at the household level, growing faster than discretionary spending, which barely grew in annual terms. Mr. Speaker. Household disposable income was up 1.1 per cent in the quarter and 5.2 per cent uh, through the year, and there are more wage rises coming because of the excellent decision taken by the Fair Work Commission. Mr. Speaker. So there are no shortage of challenges laid bare in the national accounts, Mr Speaker, but more than acknowledge them, we are acting on them, we are anticipating them, we are responding to them in the budget that was handed down not that long ago. Yeah, yeah. And we still have advantages, moderating inflation, real wages growth, low unemployment and stronger public finances as well. Our responsible and methodical and measured approach to the budget is keeping pressure off inflation without crunching the economy. Today's data confirms that that responsible fiscal strategy is exactly right for this combination of challenges that we confront together in our economy. Yeah. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for Dawson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. The latest national accounts show that compared to before the election, real disposable income has fallen by 7.8 per cent. Productivity has fallen by 5.2 per cent. Personal income taxes are 20 per cent higher, and interest on mortgage repayments have almost tripled. Why are Australians paying the price for the Albanese Labor government's incompetence and mismanagement? Call to the Treasurer. Mr. Speaker, some questions even the shadow Treasurer won't ask, and <laughs> he's thrown this one up the back for very good reason. If they want to ask us about productivity, Mr Speaker, perhaps they could mention that their decade in office was the weakest for productivity growth Order. in the 60 years that these productivity growth data has Order. been kept. Order. If they want to ask about disposable incomes, Mr Speaker, perhaps they could mention in passing at least that when we came to office, real wages were falling by 3.4 per cent, and now they're growing again. Now real wages are growing again. And perhaps somebody could explain to the honourable member up the back, with this unfortunate timing in his question about the tax take, that the tax take went down again in the national accounts this quarter, and it went down in the quarter before as well, Mr. Speaker. And so, and so, Mr. Speaker, they may have traded up when it came to the question, Mr. Speaker, but the question is still incredibly, incredibly poor. And what it betrays is a total lack of understanding of the economy, Mr Speaker, a total lack of understanding. You've got the shadow treasurer wandering around saying there's $315 billion too much spending in the budget when that number includes indexation of the age pension. 
indexation of veterans' pensions. It includes our Member efforts to strengthen Medicare after a decade of attacking Medicare. And so, Mr. Speaker, if they want to ask these questions about the economy, at least be upfront about the shameful record that you left behind when the member for Hume was the most embarrassing part of it, the most embarrassing government since Federation, and they delivered us inflation, which is higher Order. than now. The Treasurer will pause. Order. The Minister for Veterans Affairs will cease interjecting immediately, and so will the member for Herbert, so I can hear from the member for Hume on a point of order. Irrelevance, Mr Speaker. The Treasurer wants to talk about his budget, but all he wants to talk about is seat. history. Yeah. The order, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy will cease interjecting. We'll hear from the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, in terms of direct relevance, uh, the question specifically says what are the alternatives. If the Shadow Treasurer believes he's not an alternative, that's a matter for him. <laughs> <laughs> the member for McEwen will cease interjecting. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The same guy who can't get two questions in a row on National Accounts Day wants to talk about relevance, <laughs> Mr Speaker. Um, I was, asked, about, I was asked a moment ago about productivity. I pointed to the fact that we want productivity growth to be Gippsland. stronger, but the weakest 10 years was the time that they were in office. I was asked about living standards. I pointed out real wages are growing again. They were falling under those opposite. I'm asked by the Shadow Treasurer in his scripted intervention a moment ago to talk about the budget. I'd love to talk more about the budget in this place, Mr Speaker, because we have delivered a cumulative improvement of $215 billion from the big Liberal deficits that we were left, that we turned two of them into Labor surpluses. And next year's big Liberal deficit we turned into a small art deficit, Mr Speaker. So our record uh, is there for all to see when it comes to our improvements to the budget. The fact that inflation is almost half what we inherited, the fact that real wages are growing again, the fact that two out of the last three quarters we've seen productivity growth, growth go up, but it will take longer than that to turn around the record that we were left with. Now, Mr Speaker, the Shadow Treasurer has the MPI shortly. Ten minutes looking at himself in the camera, like a budgie looking in the mirror, but without Order. the insight. The Treasurer's time has concluded. The member for Petrie on a point of order. Order. Mem the mem order. Members on my right, the member for Hawke will cease to dejecting. The member for Cunningham will cease to dejecting. Yeah. The order. Order. Members on my right, there is far too much noise. If this persists, there will be a general warning issued, and no one will be given a second chance today. Okay, the member for Petrie is entitled to raise a point of order, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Standing, standing order 90, reflecting on members. Right, I'll come to it. Two things: one, the, the treasurer is a serial, serial offender, reflecting on the shadow treasurer. But two, the leader of the house's intervention. Yesterday, you threw two of our front bench out for taking a point of order and then reflecting on a member. This guy gets up, takes a point of order. Resume your seat. Order. Order. The member for Lyons will cease from dejecting. Everyone needs. The member for McEwen is warned. Don't interject, trust me, while we're trying to deal with matters before the House. The member for Petrie is entitled to raise a point of order, and we are trying to raise the standards, as began last week with the manager of opposition business on the 30th of May, about undignified personal attacks. So it goes to both sides of the chamber. The thing that the Treasurer said wasn't reflecting on an individual, so I'm just going to make sure, remind all members in their questions and in their answers. And the reason why people were removed yesterday was because they were abusing the standing orders to simply get up and make a statement. Now, out of respect for the member for Petrie, he was able to do that, but it's not a time to just get up and say how you feel or what you think. <laughs> okay? Order. 
and that's, that's, across the, that's across the chamber. Members are entitled to take a point of order, as the member for Hume did. Okay. We're just going to move to the next question. I'd like to hear from the member for Benelong. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and Homelessness. How is the Albanese Labor government's Homes for Australia plan supporting Australians now and into the future? And what has stood in the way of this vital support? I give a call to the Minister for Housing, the Minister for Homelessness and the Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order, and I do order. want to thank our member for Benelong, our terrific member, for his support for our housing plan. And of course, I joined him just a few weeks ago to go and visit new affordable homes for key workers in his electorate at Macquarie Park, which will include more than a thousand new social and affordable homes when it's completed, Mr Speaker. And it was terrific to see some of those tenants in those homes. The member for Ben Long, of the course, knows how important our $32 billion Homes for Australia plan is because he knows that people are under pressure and some people are doing it particularly tough. And that's why we brought down the budget that we did, a budget that focuses on support with cost of living, puts downward pressure on inflation and sets us up for a future made in Australia. Mr Speaker, that's why we're giving every taxpayer a tax cut on 1 July, all 13 million of them. But it's also why, of course, that our budget included more than $6 billion in new housing initiatives. And that's what our $32 billion Homes for Australia plan is all about. It's about fixing the mess that we inherited from those opposite when it comes to housing. We know the long-term housing... Speaker. We know the long-term answer to housing affordability is supply, 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 Mr yeah. Speaker. That's why we're working with the sector, the states and the territories to meet our ambitious national housing target of 1.2 million homes from 1 July by the end of the decade. And one of the ways we're doing this, of course, is through the Housing Australia Future Fund, something those opposite voted against. And, of course, they teamed up with the Greens over here to delay it by more than six months. Mr Speaker, this is the single biggest investment in social and affordable housing in more than a decade, and it recently closed its first tender round, and the response has been overwhelming, Mr Speaker. As we heard yesterday, hundreds of applications to build tens of thousands of new homes was received. This response shows why our government fought so hard for the Housing Australia Future Fund. It will also, of course, support the construction sector, with more than $90 million committed in the recent budget to make sure that we have the tradies we need to build more homes for Australians. But, of course, these were the homes, as I said, that were delayed by those opposite. They seem to think over there we don't need new homes. The member for Deakin over there admitted they don't have a target for building homes. Indeed, he seems to think they have enough homes. His quote was the number of Order. homes in Australia is actually pretty good, Mr Speaker. Maybe that's why the Leader of the Opposition didn't have one new dollar for one new home in his budget reply, Mr Speaker. Those opposite are full of negativity. We're going to get on and we're going Never to build the homes that Australia needs, projecting. including through our Housing Australia Future Fund. Before I call the member for McCullough, I'll just do a few acknowledgements in the gallery. I'm pleased to inform the House that today that President of the Gallery is a delegation of mayors and deputy mayors from the North West Queensland Region Regional Organisation of Councils, a delegation from New Zealand visiting as part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Canberra Fellowship Program. There are a group of legal study students from Waroon Senior Campus. I'm also pleased to inform the House that present in my gallery today is Cleve, a long-term protection, protection service officer whose work has taken him from Parliament House to Government House and the Lodge. Cleve was working at the Prime Minister's office here at the new Parliament House before this building even opened, where he continues to serve every day. Despite his long service, Cleve's never attended a question time until today. <laughs> Welcome. I give the call to the Honourable Member for McKellar. My question is for the Prime Minister. Speaker, my electorate office continues to receive hundreds of emails about the events in the Middle East. The people of McKellar were utterly appalled by the atrocities committed by Hamas, and our hearts broke for the people of Israel. Now, my community is deeply distressed also by the immense human suffering in Gaza. I'm concerned that this conflict is impacting social cohesion here in Australia. 
Prime Minister, what is your government's message to my community about the importance of bringing the hostages home and bringing an end to this conflict? Thank you. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Um, I thank the member for McKellar for her serious and constructive engagement on this issue, along with so many of her colleagues. It's an approach shared by this government, but one that has been tested by the actions of some members. The terrorist acts carried out by Hamas on October 7, including the murder of young Israelis peacefully attending a music festival, were abhorrent, and this parliament unequivocally condemned them. Six months ago, Australia voted for a ceasefire at the United Nations, along with 152 other countries. This government strongly supports President Biden's ceasefire proposal announced this week. Hostages must be released. Civilians must be protected. As President Biden has said, a deal would allow the United States and our partners to begin the work to rebuild homes, schools and hospitals in Gaza to help repair communities destroyed in the chaos of war. Australia is not a participant in this conflict. We have been a consistent voice for humanitarian concerns. The point that I've made as Prime Minister from the very outset is that every single innocent life matters, every Israeli, every Palestinian. This government supports a two-state solution and an enduring peace. Two states, Israel and Palestine, living peacefully side by side with security and prosperity for their people. Here in Australia, every one of us has a responsibility to keep our community safe. Our social cohesion is a national asset that all of us have built, and all of us have a responsibility to uphold and defend. Right now, our communities are distressed. People, particularly with relatives, either in Israel or the occupied territories, are distressed. We have a responsibility to not add to that distress through misinformation. Yeah. It is unacceptable that misinformation has been consciously and deliberately spread by some Green senators and MPs who have engaged in this in demonstrations outside offices and online. That includes knowingly misrepresenting motions that are moved in this parliament. All of us have a responsibility to prevent conflict in the Middle East from being used as a platform for prejudice here at home. There is no place for anti-Semitism, prejudice of any sort, Islamophobia in our communities, at our universities or outside electorate offices. Our staff do work to provide assistance to people dealing with Medicare, social security, migration and other issues. Yeah. They deserve respect, yeah. not abuse, yeah. not assault, not attacks on the office that cost taxpayers money, yeah. but cause, more importantly, considerable emotional distress and are anti-democratic by their very nature because they stop people participating in our democratic process and receiving services from members of the House of Representatives or of the Senate. Enough is enough. Yeah. The time for senators and members of parliament to continue to attend and inflame tension outside these offices must end. Yeah. The fact is that denying people the right to seek that assistance achieves nothing and tragically, it undermines the cause that protesters purport to advance. I've supported justice for Palestinians my whole life and still do. It is tragic that the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people are undermined by some people engaging in activity that completely alienates the Australian public due to the nature of that. No one should be targeted for who they are. The targeting of people because they are Jewish, because people disagree with some of the actions of the Netanyahu government, are completely unacceptable. Yeah. Political debate must be respectful. As political leaders, we have a responsibility to lower temperature, not to fuel division. We must foster the unity and cohesion and diversity 
that has always been our nation's greatest strength, a strength we all have a duty to protect. Yeah. Non -indulgent. On indulgence, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, well, uh, on indulgence, the member so for Griffith. I want to make it very clear to uh, the Australian people that there is a bipartisan position uh, in this chamber and that we speak with one voice when we condemn acts of violence wherever they take place, but particularly in our country at a period where there is heightened concern legitimately within many parts of the country. Last week I was at a school in Sydney where armed guards have a permanent presence to protect young children going to school, to protect young kids going to daycare centres, not because they've done anything wrong, not because their families have done anything wrong or stand for any bad cause, but because they are Jewish. That's why. And that has no place in our country whatsoever. It's not with any precedent in any other part of the country. And it needs to be condemned. And what the Prime Minister does today in condemning the actions of those who seek for their own political pur purposes and their own political advancement to pour fuel on this fire deserve condemnation of this chamber. And they should. From day one, from day one, in fact, after October 7, when 1,200 people were slaughtered by a terrorist organisation, to this day people are still held in a tunnel network, women and children, still held by that terrorist organisation. But as we know, the Greens political party didn't wait for advice or evidence or a security briefing. They are out there condemning the Israelis immediately and without hesitation. And now we see on university campuses the hatred directed toward people who are academics, who are students, not because of views that they hold or causes that they support, but because they are of Jewish faith. And it is completely and utterly unacceptable. And it needs to be condemned. We're seeing now the officers of elected members of parliament being targeted with red paint with vile messages of hate and discrimination and anti-Semitism, and it should be condemned. And the Greens should condemn it instead of condoning it. Yeah. Our country at the moment has an amazing Jewish community. And we know, Mr Speaker, from speaking to some of the Holocaust survivors, that they fled war-torn Europe at the end of the Second World War, and they have lived in our country in peace and harmony, have contributed to our country and to the great, amazing country it is today, without concern, without condemnation, without fear. And we know today that those people are telling us, these people who are in their 80s and 90s, are telling us that for the first time in their lifetime, they fear their presence in our country. They are talking about moving from our country and finding a safe haven somewhere else. Six million people were gassed in the Second World War. And we've got people in our country today, out there on university campuses and outside MPs' offices, denying that that took place, or saying that the biggest attack on the Jewish population since that time, the slaughter of 1,200 people, somehow doesn't count for anything and that it shouldn't be condemned. And they should be ashamed of their actions, and it has no place in our country. And, Mr Speaker, we know that Hamas is using people Palestinians as human shields, as many terrorist organisations have done through the course of history. Why would they be any different from Al-Qaeda or other terrorist organisations that we've known? Why would they value human life when many people who have had the depraved, the depraved approach that they have over the course of history, why would they be any different? Of course they're not. And we want peace delivered as quickly as possible. It is in the hands of Hamas right now. There is a deal on the table. Hamas has the ability to bring this to an end, but of course they won't because they don't care for Palestinians, they don't care for Israelis, they care for their own power base. And the world should stand together to condemn the actions of anti-Semitism and we stand as one in this chamber, or we should stand as one to make sure that we condemn the unacceptable levels of anti-Semitism that we see playing out on our streets. It has no place. 
and we will take Order. everything, every action we need as a chamber to make sure that we condemn those acts of anti-Semitism in our country. And the Greens political party today is properly and rightly condemned. The Leader of the Australian Greens is on a point of order. No, I'm seeking the call in the same way that the Prime Minister yeah. and the Opposition Leader were given extensive period to free range in an attack on the Greens, and I'm seeking the call order, on indulgence. Order. You can seek the call. You're seeking the indulgence from the Speaker. In practice, respond. that has always been granted for when there is a agreed position. And if you look at the history of indulgence, that's how it has been conducted. So I, 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 I'm not finished. I'm not finished. If you wish to be granted indulgence, I'll be listening carefully to make sure you're in alliance with what was just said before the House. That is how indulgence works. If you wish to have another point of view, this is not the time to do that. There are order. There are other forms of the House, whether being misrepresented at the conclusion of question time or other forms of the House, to make your statement known. The order, order, order. The member for Griffith, the member for Hawke. I've just deal with the leader of the Australian Greens, and then I'll give the call to the member for um, Lindsay. So, on indulgence, in light of what I've said, in remarks I've said about indulgence, on indulgence, the leader of the Australian Greens. Thank you, Speaker. This House is united in condemning anti-Semitism and condemning Islamophobia, and we also condemn the invasion of Gaza. Now. I will not be lectured to about peace and non-violence by people who back the invasion of Gaza. Children are dying. Children are dying because the Israeli army has engineered a famine. And instead of talking about the victims, the Prime Minister wants to make it about himself. The leader of the Australian Greens will resume his seat. The leader of the Australian Greens will resume your seat. I explained clearly. How indulgence works, it is not being granted. The, the I and the leader of the opposition. The, no. There was ex leave, leave was, no, no, no. Resume your seat. Leave was not granted. Indulgence. Was, in granted, was granted. The member for Lindsay now has a point of order, and then we'll move to question time. I thank the member for Lindsay. Give a call to the member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the Albanese Labor government taking action to make more things here in Australia? What approaches has the government rejected? Call to the Prime Minister. Well, th I thank the member for Jagger Jagger for her question. Indeed, uh, the future Made in Australia proposals represent an important recognition of the strategic importance of manufacturing and open up hopeful opportunities. Now, they're not my words. They're from an open letter signed by 70 Australian economists expressing their strong support for our future Made in Australia plan. They characterise our plan as an important shift in emphasis and vision that will have benefits that spread through the economy and through society. Because what this is about is setting us up for the future. Well-paid industrial jobs, supporting regional communities, contributing at the same time to the decarbonisation that's necessary in our economy. And that's what drives this government, a vision for an Australian-made future that uses our resources to make more things here, moving up the value chain and creating good jobs as we do, investing in renewable energy and strengthening our economic and national security as we do, Order. 
drawing on the full potential and aspirations of all of our people and making sure that those opportunities reach every part of the country. Yeah. Now, there couldn't be a clearer contrast between this and those opposite. They offer no way forward, just a dead end. They boast about shutting down Australian manufacturing and driving industries offshore. They brag about ending the Australian car industry, costing jobs and skills, putting a handbrake on the industry and cutting us out of global supply chains. Now, what we want to do is to make sure that we take advantage of those opportunities. The shift in the global economy to a clean energy economy. The opportunities that are there in areas like green hydrogen and green metals. The opportunities that are there to have advanced manufacturing here in Australia. Uh, that is what we need, to have faith in our people, to have faith in the opportunities and optimism about how we can just not compete with the world, but we can beat the world. Those opposite All don't have an agenda. They have just a vendetta against workers, against manufacturing, against fair wages, against aspiration and against ambition. And that's what we see from the gibberish that we've had uh, here across the chamber uh, whilst this answer has been given. They don't think Australians can make things here. They just want, they just want those jobs and that value adding to occur somewhere else. Well, that's not this government's approach, and that's why we'll continue to provide economic security by having that future made here in Australia. The call to the Honourable Member for Canning. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Veteran, Veterans Affairs and Defence Personnel. Was it ever the policy of the government to accept foreign nationals from any country permanently resident in Australia into the Australian Defence Force from 1 January next year. I give the call to the Minister of Veterans Affairs and the Minister of Defence Personnel. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Canning for his question about the government's initiative to increase recruitment to our Defence Force. Because, as he well knows, when he was Assistant Minister for Defence, the recruitment of members into our Defence Force was a critical, critical issue. And whilst they accepted that they needed to grow the Defence Force, what we actually saw under their term in office Order. was the, that the numbers going into the defence minister, the minister were declining. Will, the minister will pause. The member for Barker is warned and can stop eating whatever he's eating at the moment. <laughs> it's about the fourth time that's happened. OK. Well, if it's ice... Chew slowly. <laughs> Order. The minister wasn't asked about opposition policy. He was asked about the government's policy. I'm just going to make sure that he is being directly relevant, so that's not an excuse to go back in time. Order. The member for Canning has asked his question. Just make sure he's being directly relevant. He's entitled to some compare and contrast, but we've had 30 seconds of a preamble. We'll now get back to the question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's important to put into context why we need to be bold in our adoption of policy when it comes to growing our defence force, and that's exactly what we have done. And so, along with a, a large sway of policies, we have announced a policy to grow our defence force from our permanent resident population. Order, and that's exactly speaker. what myself and the Deputy Prime Minister announced yesterday, and we're very happy with that policy, because it goes straight to Order. the heart of making Member sure that we Gippsland. are addressing the issues confronting our Defence Force. Now, I know it's difficult for the Member for Canning, Order. and clearly it's difficult for the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Resume Speaker. your seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, it's on relevance. The question was very tight. The Minister yesterday gave three different versions at odds with the Minister for Defence, and we're asking him very directly, was it ever the government's policy, what he actually announced and then was forced to retract yesterday? So the minister is able to talk about the policy if he wishes to answer it in a direct way, but he's got to remain directly relevant. So that means for the remainder of his answer, not to talk about opposition policy, because he wasn't asked about that question, he was asked about government policy. And he, will, he shall return to the question. I can't make him answer in a certain way. 
I can make sure that the minister is being directly relevant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government's policy is as announced yesterday by the Deputy Prime Minister and myself. As we both Order. said yesterday in very clear terms, we are extending eligibility for Order. people Order. to apply to join the Defence Force to those that are permanent residents from New Zealand from 1 July next year and from Five Eyes Nations from 1 January if they've been here for a year as a permanent resident, Order. haven't served in a foreign page. military, are otherwise eligible for citizenship and, of course, pass all the relevant security vetting requirements. And what's really important about this policy and very important about the question just asked by the member Order. for Canning, Mr Speaker, is not only is that the government's policy, it's a policy that the member for Canning also endorsed in May of last year, where he went out saying that we should be increasing recruitment from non-citizens non of Australia, Mr Speaker. He endorsed this policy. In fact, when Order. I spoke about Order. this policy in Gibson. January of this year, he came out and endorsed Order. my comments calling for this policy, Mr Order. Speaker, and I thank the opposition for their support of the government's policy, as the Deputy Prime Minister and I announced. Order. Order. When the House comes to order, we'll hear from the member for Spence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. How is the Albanese Labor government increasing bulk billing? Why is it needed after a decade of cuts and neglect to Medicare? The call to the minute order. The call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for Spence for his question. For he has arena. the privilege of representing the northern suburbs of our great city of Adelaide, a community centred around Elizabeth, which of course gave us Jimmy Barnes and many thousands of Holden motor vehicles until, of course, those opposite decided to shut down the car industry a decade ago. But the member for Spence has also been a relentless advocate for our strengthening Medicare program to boost bulk billing, to make medicines cheaper and to roll out urgent care clinics, including the urgent care clinic in Elizabeth, Mr Speaker. It's open seven days a week. It's fully bulk billed for patients and, importantly, it's taking much needed pressure off the local Lyle McEwen Hospital, Mr Speaker. Now, Susanna's Google review is a good example of the hundreds of patients that are seen every week at the Elizabeth Clinic. She wrote in her review, extremely quick check-in to the Elizabeth Urgent Care Centre for a laceration to my hand. Highly recommend that over waiting many hours in an emergency department. It's a perfect example of what's urgent but not an emergency, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the 58 urgent care clinics that we opened last year have already seen 425,000 patients delivering urgent care, all fully bulk billed. And we also committed to boosting bulk billing for GP visits more generally, Mr Speaker, through a $3.5 billion investment to triple the bulk billing incentive. And I'm pleased to report today Mr Speaker, that in the seven months since that funding kicked in, bulk billing has risen in every single state and territory in the Federation, by 5 per cent in our state of South Australia, by more than 8 per cent in the state of Tasmania. Mr. Speaker. Across the country, Order. delivering around 1.7 million additional free visits to the doctor in just seven months. Mr. Speaker. In April alone, there were 425,000 additional free visits to the doctor that would not have occurred but for the changes we made last year, Mr Speaker. Now, for Labor, that's a big deal, because for Labor, bulk billing is the beating heart of Medicare, Mr Speaker. But, of course, our approach here could not be more different from those opposite, reflected in the members for question about 10 years of cuts and neglect, yeah, led by a man who 10 years ago famously said there were too many free Medicare services, Mr Speaker, too many apparently, a man who then tried to abolish bulk billing altogether in his horror health budget delivered 10 years ago almost to the day, Mr Speaker. Well, that's not our way. That's not our way in Labor, because Medicare is in our DNA. And that's why the member for Spence and every single member on this side of the House is fighting so hard to strengthen it. Yeah. The call to the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Health. Can the Minister confirm that after two years of labour, bulk billing rates have dropped by 11 per cent? Order. Give the call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Wow. Uh, I appreciate that Dorothy Dixer from the <laughs> member opposite, Mr Speaker, a member that I think all members of this House recognise as not the worst health minister in the history of Medicare, but perhaps the second worst minister in uh, Medicare. What, what I said in the lead... Yep. Order. Members on my right. The member for Herbert, I'm trying to hear the manager of opposition business. On a point well, of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, again on standing order 90. Um, inappropriate, disrespectful language, and the minister who is a serial offender should be counselled. I'm always happy to counsel people, manager of opposition business. Thank you for raising that point again about the repeated practice of undignified personal attacks. Just going to make sure the minister does not use any such language moving forward for the remainder of this answer and any other answers he may have today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Leader asked me about the trajectory in bulk billing, and I was very clear in the lead in to the last election, and have been since, that bulk billing has been falling over the last period of time. And it's no surprise. If you freeze the income of general practice for six years, which is what the Leader of the Opposition kicked off in that budget I referred to, and what was continued, what was continued by the Deputy Leader when she was the Health Minister, things will change. Things will change. I've been honest about this. I've also been more transparent and honest about what is actually happening about bulk billing than those opposite were. They tried to cloak the bulk billing figure in the one-off COVID measures, the one-off COVID measures that had to be bulk billed. The minister will pause. The deputy leader option a point of order. The point of order is relevant, Mr. Speaker. How can it be in order with such a tight question to Very talk specific. about the opposition? Very specific. Well, the question was about after two years about bulk billing rates. I guess the minister wants to defend the accusation that they have or haven't dropped, and is going to be talking about order, and is going to be talking about what the rates were, what he believed the rates were. I'm not aware of exactly what the rates are, so I can't adjudicate. The member for Riverina is trying to help. I know. Trust me, he's not. So, if the minister can just make sure he's being directly relevant for the remainder of the answer, he won't be at order. He won't be able for the remaining one minute, or fi sorry, 57 seconds, to talk about the opposition. Well, unfortunately for the deputy leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, the world was not created on the 21st of May, 2022. <laughs> we, we inherited a Medicare system that had been deeply impacted by a decade of cuts order. and neglect. And I said very openly, bulk billing was continuing to slide, which is why we put. In the last budget, in 2023, a record investment to turn bulk billing around. And I said that would not happen quickly. I was very honest about that. I also was more transparent with the Australian people about what was really happening in bulk billing by starting to report every single month how many visits to the doctor to general practice for bulk billing. Those opposite never reported that. They cloaked they cloaked and disguised their bulk billing data in these one-off COVID data, these tens of millions of COVID. Order. The, the Leader of the Nationals will cease interjecting so I can hear from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. A minute left to go, Mr Speaker. A point of order understanding Order 91C, which states a member's conduct is disorderly if they willfully refuse to conform to a standing order. You have brought the Minister back to the relevance of the question and he continues to talk about the Opposition. Order. Just take a, take a breather. Um, the Minister is entitled to do some compare and contrast, but if he continues with that, I will sit him down. The Deputy Leader is correct in her point of order, and he needs to be mindful of the standing orders. Here's the call. Well, Mr Speaker, no one has talked about the sorry state of bulk billing for the last several years, including since we came to government more than me. 
which is why we put a record investment in last year's budget to turn it around. We tripled the bulk billing incentive, and since it kicked in in the 1st of November, it has started to rise in every single state and territory in the Federation, in seven months delivering 1.7 million additional visits. I've never sought to deny that bulk billing was sliding. I advocated it in this parliament, in the community and in the Expenditure Review Committee to deliver the biggest investment in the history of Medicare for bulk billing. And this guy tries to call a stunt when he started it all. This guy started it all with the worst health budget in the history of the Federation. Look, whatever just happened there is completely undignified for the House. We're just going to... I'm going to ask all members for the remainder of question time. It's a plea to everyone to lift the standards and lift the tone. That's everyone. I'll give the call to the honourable member for Higgins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. How is the Albanese Labor government acting to help families and businesses with the cost of energy bills, and how does this differ from the other energy policies? I call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank my honourable friend for the question and recognise her climate leadership in this parliament, Mr Speaker? Mr Speaker. On the 1st of July, every Australian will receive a tax cut Order. and every Australian with an energy bill will receive energy bill relief, Mr Speaker, every single Australian. And also, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to inform the member for Higgins and the House that from today, Australians who want to reduce their bills and emissions by installing solar panels or batteries or energy efficiency can apply for a concessional loan under our housing energy upgrade fund, Mr Speaker, from today, member with the first round of that funding open. So these are practical and realistic steps to help Australians with cost of living pressure. Now, the honourable member asked me how it compares to other energy policies. So I have to confess we are searching for alternative energy policies, Mr. Speaker. We are searching, we are searching for alternative energy policies with very little detail. But to be Order. fair, we are starting to see some of the uh, contours of the opposition's policy emerge. Recently. Now, I have to say I have very real differences with Senator Canavan, very real differences on policy, but he does tend to be pretty straightforward in what he thinks, Mr Speaker. And he was asked about the opposition's alleged nuclear policy, and he said, but we need to build coal as well, in my view, because nuclear will take too long. Nuclear will take too long. We know from the CSIRO Order. and so many experts that no nuclear in Australia will be up and running before 2040. And Senator Canavan, as he always does, said the quiet bit out loud because this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. They want to delay renewables and they want to keep coal in the system for, long, for longer because they just don't believe in renewable energy. Now, the, the government also passed the Net Zero Authority Bill through the Parliament in recent days. This is an opportunity for those opposite to talk about the regions, to talk about job creation, renewable energy. But what we heard from so many opposition members was about nuclear power and nuclear energy. Now, we've got some of the searing policy insight, some of the details, some of the policy insight. We had the member for Lyons say, and I quote, nuclear power stations are basically big kettles. That, that, was, that was the big searing policy contribution. The question, is, the question is, where will those big kettles be? Where will the big kettles be? Member for Lyon, I said, Lyon. Where will the big kettles be? Will there be, will there be a big kettle next to the big banana, Mrs. Speaker? Where will they go? But our friend, the member for Gippsland, is also very honest. He said, Order. he said, it's premature to be ruling regions in or out. There is simply no proposal on the table right now. Well, he's right about that. But we know the leader of the National Party has polled, has polled the places where they want to put nuclear reactors. He's done opinion polling. But he won't release the details because, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to energy policy, the these are not serious time people. Has concluded. Order. The member for Page. I'd like to hear from the honourable. Order. Members on my right. I'd like to hear from the honourable member for Fairfax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Does the minister support the New South Wales Labor government's extension 
of coal-fired generation at Arari. Order. Give a order. Members on, <laughs> members on my right. Order. The, the assistant treasurer will cease interjecting. The minister has the call. Can I begin to tell you how much I appreciate this question from the member for Fairfax, Mr. Speaker? Because I've actually not held a press conference on this. I've held multiple press conferences on this. Multiple press conferences. Where at each occasion I have said I agree with the New South, minister, with New South Wales Minister for Energy that we want coal fire power stations in the grid for not a day longer than they should be and not leaving a day earlier than they can, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. And Mr. Speaker, recently, recently the New South Wales Government did announce a policy to extend two units of the Araring power station for two years. Now, this is after the Araring power station closure was brought forward by seven years a few years ago when the member for Hume was the Minister for Energy. And the member for Hume's big contribution at that point Order. was to say, well, I heard about this on the radio. No one told me, Mr Speaker. <laughs> the New South Wales Minister for Energy didn't tell him. Origin didn't tell him because they didn't trust him and he had no involvement in the process whatsoever. On the contrary, Mr Speaker, we are working with state governments across the board in every single state and territory on this energy transition, regardless of what party they represent. We work closely with the New South Wales Government as we worked with the previous New South Wales Government, Mr Speaker. I have a good working relationship with my state and territory ministers, all of Order. them, regardless the of their political the party. When... Have you concluded your answer? Oh. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume, Resume your seat. Okay. We're going to go. Uh, uh, the member for Fairfax, and well, I don't care who picked it. Everyone, everyone can just cease interjecting. So, and the member for Page. I want to hear from the member for Pearce and her question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. How is the Albanese Labor government continues its work to keep Australians safe online? Give the call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for her question. Because protecting children and other vulnerable Australians from online harms is a key focus of the Albanese government. Online safety is a collective responsibility between industry, regulators, government and civil society. And I acknowledge the impacted family members who have come to Canberra this week and for their brave advocacy. The landscape is changing rapidly. That's why we're using all levers to address new and emerging harms. And it's the reason why I announced last November that I would bring forward the review of the Online Safety Act by a year because we must ensure our regulatory settings are fit for purpose. When the Online Safety Act commenced in early 2022, generative AI was barely a topic of discussion for most Australians. The review is well underway, and I encourage all Australians to have their say through the consultation on important issues, including penalties and enforcement, the role and use of recommender systems, and harmful content like body image harms. The government is taking a methodical and joined-up approach across portfolios and ministers in this work. The Joint Select Committee on Social Media and Australian Society is examining the role of platform algorithms and the impact of corporate decision-making on the content that Australians see and their impact on mental health. For the first time, the dating app industry is engaging with government to develop new rules to support at-risk users and improve their safety practices. We allocated $6.5 million in the budget for an age assurance trial to test the efficacy of a range of technologies that could be used to protect children from harmful content, including use cases for restricting access to age-inappropriate content, such as pornography, age-restricted content and social media. Importantly, Mr Speaker, we're supporting the eSafety Commissioner to implement the Online Safety Act, including by quadrupling its ongoing base funding. And last week's update to the basic online safety expectations is critical to providing the eSafety Commissioner with a clear and up-to-date remit. Mr Speaker, I acknowledge the dedication of the eSafety Commissioner and her agency and their tireless work 
to keep Australians safe online. These are public servants doing vital work that is needed to uphold Australian law in the interests of all citizens. To that end, the government acknowledges the decision of eSafety as an independent regulator to both bring and discontinue legal proceedings in the federal court against Excorp. The government backs our regulators and we back the eSafety Commissioner, particularly in light of the reprehensible threats to her physical safety and the threats to her family in the course of doing her job. Finally, I understand that parents may feel overwhelmed when it comes to keeping their children safe online. There's a wealth of resources freely available at esafety.gov.au and I encourage all members to avail themselves of these resources and to share them widely. Yeah. On indulgence, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, very quickly on indulgence, uh, Mr Speaker, I want to um, thank the Minister for her update. Uh, there's no more important task than making sure we keep children safe uh, in our community, and that is in the real world as much as it is online. Many of these companies operate uh, in a lawless environment and have no regard even for the rule of law uh, in a country like ours. Uh, Julian McGrant uh, is one of the finest public servants uh, in the employment of the Commonwealth of Australia, and the treatment uh, and the personal abuse and attacks uh, that she has been subject to, the threats and intimidation, uh, should be absolutely condemned. And uh, I met with, uh, uh, with Ms Immigrant uh, last week, and I hope the Australian Federal Police, uh, as I'm sure they will, uh, continue to pursue those people that uh, have made these outrageous attacks on her. The call to the Honourable Member for Curtin. This is a question for the Treasurer. Too many women struggle to navigate the legal system that's meant to protect them when they fear violence. Women's legal services turn away more than 50,000 women a year due to resource constraints and, with no new funding in the budget, are now having to reduce services. Why didn't the budget prioritise increasing these services and will the Treasurer increase funding and certainty for community legal services so women can get the support they need when in fear of violence? The call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and thanks to the member for Curtin for her question. Uh, there was some new money in the budget uh, for legal services, working closely with the Attorney-General, but I do acknowledge uh, that we have to finalise the agreement uh, in order to provide some more funding uh, to make sure that these really crucial uh, legal services that we're all familiar with in all of our communities, particularly uh, for women at risk, uh, that that funding can continue. I've had a number of meetings with the Attorney-General uh, we're very conscious of the pressures on these legal centres and these legal services. Uh, we provided a small amount of funding to keep things going uh, for the time being, but we do know and we are committed to uh, a new agreement that provides more funding. Give a call to the honourable member for Newcastle. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. What action is the Albanese Labor government uh, taking to combat the serious harm being caused by sharing sexually explicit deep fake materials? Call to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for Newcastle for her question. Digitally created and altered sexually explicit material that is shared without consent is a damaging and deeply distressing form of abuse. Uh, we know that this abuse overwhelmingly targets women and girls. It inflicts deep, long-lasting harm on victims. It perpetuates harmful gender stereotypes and it contributes to gender-based violence. In recent years, the distribution of sexual material created or altered using technology has become increasingly common, and the risk of abuse is growing as artificial intelligence programs become more widely accessible. The Albanese government has no tolerance for this form of insidious criminal behaviour. Today, I introduced legislation to create new criminal offences to ban the sharing of non-consensual, sexually explicit deep fake material online. The Albanese government's reforms will make clear that those who share sexually explicit material without consent using technology like artificial intelligence will be subject to serious criminal penalties. It will impose a maximum penalty of six years 
imprisonment for the sharing of non-consensual deep fake sexually explicit material where the person also created the deep fake that is shared without consent this will carry a, a higher penalty of seven years imprisonment as an aggravated offence these penalties will assist in protecting vulnerable people from serious online harm and deter and punish this abusive and damaging behaviour. Given the significant and continuing harm that is being caused by this abusive behaviour, I look forward to the full support of the Parliament for these reforms. The Albanese Government continues to deliver on its commitment to end violence against women, to tackle the scourge of online harm and to keep Australians safe. Yeah. Call to the Honourable Member for Deakin. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the NDIS and Government Services. Minister, NDIA officials told estimates that under the Albanese Labor government, up to $2 billion uh, of the $45 billion per, per year devoted to the NDIS is being spent on illicit drugs, holidays and expensive cars, just to name a few, and that 90 per cent of NDIS plan managers have significant indicators of fraud. Why has the minister and his hand-picked CEO allowed this to happen? I give a call to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the Minister for Services Australia. The Minister for the Environment will cease interjecting. Uh, thank you very much. There's, um, the, the member opposite is referring to some evidence that was given in estimates on, in the last couple of days. The, he didn't mention the person who gave the evidence. Yep. The person who gave... Well, don't worry, mate, I think you write your own speeches. Uh, he gave... Um, the, gentleman who gave, the gentleman who gave the evidence... The gentleman who gave the evidence... His name is Mr John Dardo. John Dardo. The reason why he was giving that evidence is because I picked him to come and work at the NDA because those opposite did not take seriously fraud in the NDIA. He and his team, he is in charge of what's called the Fraud Fusion Task Force. Another memo to the members opposite, we set it up. $126 million to tackle fraud. And what did those opposite do? Nothing. Zip. Nada. Nothing at all. It's because of this government we are now addressing the issues in the scheme. The reality is, if you want to talk about all of Mr Dardo's evidence, he has said that the problem with the NDIS payment system is that it's immature, because those opposite never invested in the back door of the system to make sure the shonks couldn't rip off disabled people and the taxpayer. The gall of those opposite. What Mr Dardo has informed me Order. is about plan managers. Plan managers, he has said, but uh, they surveyed 900 of the smallest ones of least turnover of business. It turns out that 350 of them are not reporting their financial income to the ATO. But that is because until this government was elected, no one ever asked them to have the ATO and the NDA talk to each other. These plan managers pay themselves as downstream providers. They are approaching participants on public transport and offering cash. They're offering cash to participants on the condition that no services will be delivered. They're fabricating services and claims. They're pretending to be the participant. The very reason that we can debate this today is because Order. it takes a Labor government to catch the crooks. You had an F troop of ministers in the NDIA. Now, you're actually doing a better job as opposition spokesperson. You've got Banquo's ghost, Senator Reynolds, running around in the upper house. You had a... Um, yeah. The opposition put up Stuart Robert, the MP, who even they don't own anymore. <laughs> the problem is that these problems have taken a long time to establish. But ever since that we've got elected, Fraud Fusion Task Force, 500 compliance investigations, 222 matters under investigation right now, 20 prosecutions, 20 prosecutions right now. When the opposition were in power, $231 million Order. of payments was investigated. The Under Labor, it's several billion. Thank goodness. Yeah. Order. Members on my left will cease interjecting so I can hear from the Honourable Member for Wills. 
Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. What is the Albanese Labor government doing to ease cost of living pressures and provide relief for every Australian, and who will benefit? I'll give a call to the Minister for Social Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Wills for the question and also his advocacy for particularly low-paid and uh, income support recipients in his electorate. Of course, the Albanese's number one priority is to provide cost of living relief for every Australian. And with this year's budget, we are building on previous budgets, of course, uh, providing responsible cost of living relief that eases the pressure on people but doesn't add to inflation. And one of the ways we've been able to provide immediate assistance is through our uh, is helping with rental costs. And of course, through our increases to the maximum rates of Commonwealth rent assistance. Now, as outlined in the budget, we will provide a further 10 per cent increase to the maximum rates, giving more support to pensioners, income support recipients and low-income families to help manage their rental pressures. Now, this is tangible, additional support. And for example, from the 20th of September 2024, a single parent with three children who rents will receive an additional $80 a fortnight in rent assistance as a result of measures we've taken as a government as since coming to office. Now, we are also providing more assistance to those on job seekers, particularly those who face significant barriers getting back into employment and need a little bit extra support. As announced in the budget, we will expand eligibility for the higher rate of job seeker to include recipients with a partial capacity to work of less than 15 hours. This will provide these recipients with an extra $55 a fortnight to support them with cost of living pressures. And it builds on our change in the last budget to extend the higher rate of job seeker to people aged 55 and over who also face additional barriers. Now, the government is also supporting older Australians with cost of living pressures by freezing the deeming rates for a further 12 months so that part pensioners, along with other income support recipients, can keep more of what they earn on their investments without impacting their payments. And we're also keeping medicines cheaper by freezing the maximum co-payment for general patients for one year and five years for concessional patients. This means cheaper medicines for over six million pensioners and other concession card holders. And this includes the 29,000 additional older Australians who now have access to the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card as a result of our government's changes to eligibility. And of course, households will also get energy bill relief. And of course, from the 1st of July, all Australian taxpayers will get a tax cut because this government is committed to providing cost of living relief for all Australians, not just some. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Mayo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I'm advised by constituents that by July 2025, sight-saving eye injections for macular degeneration will no longer be delivered routinely in private hospitals meaning those currently covered by private health insurance will need to pay in full or go without treatment. Is this correct? And if so, why has the government made this decision? A call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Uh, I thank the member for Mayor for her question. I'm not aware of that. I'm happy to take that on notice and come back to the member as soon as possible. A call to the member for Cunningham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. What is the Albanese Labor government's response to recent proposals to cut workers' pay and take away their rights? The call to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Order. The member for right is warned. The call to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Minister for the Arts. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Cunningham for the question. Uh, somebody who is representing, representing 72,000 people all about to get a tax cut, where, where every, every taxpayer gets a tax cut because they elected the member for Cunningham, and also representing a whole lot of those 2.6 million workers who, as of the decision this week, are going to get a pay rise. Now, the, I'm asked about policies quite specifically 
that the gov pathways the government won't go down and policies that we've rejected. And uh, it's often you'll get resolutions from conferences and you sort of think, oh, that's just, that's just an outlandish conference resolution and you, you don't need to take it seriously. But rarely do you find the shadow minister, Senator Cash, has actually written in response to the resolutions that happened at their New South Wales conference, describing them as good ideas that align strongly with the coalition's approach to industrial relations. So while we were told a while ago that they had a targeted approach, now we're getting to find out exactly what's in it. Because we'd just been told it was an approach of repeals from what had been done during this term. But remember a while ago we heard those words from Tony Abbott that work choices was dead, buried and cremated? Because what's being proposed in these resolutions that the shadow ministers described as good ideas are issues that haven't been law in Australia since work choices. What was dead, buried and cremated, sort of the hands reaching up through the dirt and finding its way back, zombie agreements that were previously abolished finding their way to be enlivened. Here's what they're going to. One, making it easier to sack people. Two, what did they want to do with the better off overall test? Abolish the better off overall test. What do they, they want to bring back, now, a lot of people might remember this from the work choices era, where you can have an individual contract, but it's not negotiated, it's a condition of employment. So unless you agree to, the, to, to worse wages and conditions than you'd otherwise get, you don't get the job. That's one of the things that's been referred to by the shadow minister as one of the good ideas that's in line with their policy. And then removing award protections for anyone who is above average wages. So have a think at some of the, some of the occupations where you've got classifications where people are earning above average, we weekly, er above average weekly earnings but are within the award system. People like teachers, people like police officers, people like coal miners. What does it mean for those workers? It means, it means no award entitlements to rostering rules, nothing for meal breaks, no overtime rates, no shift work, no public holiday penalty rates. Order. It the means a pay cut, which is what they concluded. want. The call to the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I ask further questions placed on the notice paper.